Welcome to TVBS Meeting Room, where we tackle global issues with a view from Taiwan. I'm your host, Wen Chi Yu. Today's guest is Jacob Helberg, a national security expert and a commissioner on the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review, a U.S. congressional entity. He was last on our program for his book, The Wires of War. We're glad to have him back to talk about U.S. concerns of TikTok, Chinese technology companies, and investments. Welcome, Jacob. Uh, Thanks for having me, Wenchi. It's great to be here. <laughs> All right, it's fine. They'll they'll do it. Um, okay. So um, the fight to change TikTok's ownership from Beijing headquartered by Dance to American ownership started in the Trump administration. And why is TikTok such a big concern to the United States national security? Isn't it just a social media app for fun? It just for your information, TikTok is also very popular among Taiwanese young people. Yeah, so there are three big concerns that policymakers often debate in the U.S. The first and perhaps the most minor is a trade reciprocity concern. China doesn't allow any American content platform in China. Um, it banned most American content platforms in the early 2010s, uh, right after the Arab Spring, when actually right around when you worked at the State Department. Google, Facebook, Netflix, GitHub, none of them are allowed in China. So trade reciprocity is an issue that has a lot of political resonance in the U.S. Um, the second, which has really been brought out in full technicolor in the last year or so, are the propaganda concerns. The fact that there are concerns that the Chinese Communist Party could use its control over TikTok in order to push state propaganda and the CCP's political agenda in the US on 170 million devices. Those concerns hit close to home for a lot of people um, after the, the uh, horrible Hamas attacks against Israel. We saw the tidal wave of anti-Israeli propaganda. There's now a lot of academic literature that's coming out that's showing that um, a lot of the content on TikTok uh, is uh, skewed in, in a manner that uh, seems to point to an agenda to try to divide the U.S. and its allies. So uh, there's a clear pattern. If you try searching for keywords like Uyghurs or Himalayas, you're going to get almost no content compared to the content that um, uh, uh, appears organically on other platforms like Instagram. Uh, and on the other hand, obviously, uh, Al-Qaeda's letter to America went viral uh, in a way that was incredibly odd and strange to a lot of people. So propaganda is number two. And third, the data security and surveillance, which has been one of the longstanding perennial concerns with the app, the fact that the Chinese Communist Party is able to instrumentalize its control over the app in order to surveil, access the microphones on the cell phones, um, monitor a user's activities on other applications, and harvest American user data for China's political objectives. Um, there is now a growing body of evidence that shows a troubling pattern. User, we know that user data of TikTok stars has been stored in China. We know that ByteDance used TikTok to track and spy on, on journalists from the Financial Times and Forbes. We know that former executives who have left the company claim that the CCP has a master backdoor into everything on the app. And just last week, senators who received the Justice Department's classified briefing on TikTok called the data security concerns shocking. So you're seeing all of these concerns culminate into a broad effort to legislate, um, which I think is ultimately the right thing to do for national security. And I'm very proud that the commission that I serve on recommended legislative restrictions on Chinese social media companies. Well, it's clearly a very complicated case. Uh, it's more than just this company, right? Because you've touched on, you know, reciprocity issue. You've touched on foreign influence uh, through media. And of course, you know, the last part is data security. And each one of them is a big uh, issue in, in and of itself. Um, and it's not only about Chinese ownership, but, you know, even the U.S. social media has lots of issues around foreign interference, uh, et cetera. Um, what's interesting was, um, as I mentioned, right, Trump started, you know, the, this concern about uh, TikTok. But then 
when recently um, the bill in the House was uh, being uh, reviewed, he then said he doesn't really support the House version of this bill. Um, and his former Treasury Secretary Mnuchin also offered to buy. So um, we're also not sure yet if the Senate will actually approve TikTok's uh, ownership sale bill. And even if it does pass, right, the Chinese government has signaled that it would oppose uh, the sale. So where is this all headed? Um, just about the single company. And is it really about TikTok? Or is there a larger policy agenda that you and others and many others uh, in the US are trying to address? Well, you're right. Uh, you know, it, I'm so happy you brought up um, the fact that President Trump was actually very ahead of the curve when it comes to the TikTok issue. And I think it's important to be honest about that. He was one of the first ones to call out the national security risks of TikTok back in 2020 before anyone was actually paying attention. Um, I think one of the interesting facts that um, really got lost in the media is that uh, Trump's comments on TikTok on Truth Social did not actually oppose the House bill. They expressed concerns about Meta. And days later in an interview, um, President Trump did express concerns about China's ability to, to, to control uh, the application of TikTok and you know, uh, express some degree of support for removing China's control of TikTok. The reason that you're seeing so much focus in the US on TikTok specifically is because TikTok is on 170 million American devices. No other Chinese company comes close, so it poses unique risks. But at the end of the day, the bill that passed the House is largely fo focused on any social media application that's controlled by a foreign adversary, namely from Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, and has over 100 has over a million monthly active users. So there is a broader policy at play. Historically, the U.S. government has long had restrictions on the foreign ownership of traditional media in TV and radio. Social media companies have benefited from a loophole and weren't subject to these restrictions. And ultimately, the House version that passed closes that loophole and brings U.S. policy closer in line with where it has been historically. You know, this is, again, really interesting, right? Because um, this touches on beyond China, just it's, it's social media, right? Should social media companies be regulated as a telecom, uh, the traditional sort of telecom companies? That's one big issue. Um, but, you know, you also have been, um, you mentioned sort of foreign ownership, right? So you've been cautionary about just in general, Chinese owned technology companies. Uh, obviously, TikTok is a big one. And uh, there's Timo, there's Xin. Um, can you just explain why are you so concerned about in general technology companies that are popular in the United States? Absolutely. And it's such a, an important issue for us to reckon with from a national security standpoint. The Chinese Communist Party has completely erased the dividing line between the public and the private sector. That is the fundamental issue. They have made the decision to pass a number of successive laws from the national intelligence law to the counter espionage law last year um, that completely erased the traditional division between the public and the private. There is no such thing as a private company in China anymore. Every company in China can be enlisted to advance the CCP's political agenda. Can and you that, just, um, can you on that point, do you mind just elaborating on that? Because I don't think that's a concept that's, um, you know, that, that non-Chinese are used to it. Like, what does that mean? No private companies are private. It means that every, that, Every company in China effectively has a dual mandate. Um, on the one hand, it has the mandate to serve its traditional purpose of a company the way that we understand in the US, maximizing value to shareholders, producing products that people want on the private market. But on the other hand, it has another mandate, which is to help advance the political objectives and agenda of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, inside China or potentially abroad. 
And that is very unique. You don't have that in most other countries. In the US, the US government can't simply ask a private company to advance its agenda and require that by law. Um, same thing in Europe, there is a division between the private and the public. And that dual mandate poses unique risks when we're talking about technology companies, which most of which are inherently dual use in nature. So um, in that case, right, um, do you wish to see the U.S. basically without any presence of uh, Chinese technology companies? Um, and, and how would you define Chinese? I mean, we're getting into sort of, you know, a lot of uh, the concerns uh, from the Asian American communities in particular, right? So, for example, um, when you say Chinese, do you mean by like location of the headquarters or nationality of the founders or by financial ownership? And if it's by financial ownership, you know, TikTok is actually owned by quite a few large investment firms in the US like BlackRock, you know, General Atlantic, et cetera. Um, so how do how do we really think about this this sort of Chinese technology companies? Yeah, you have to look at the Chinese Communist Party's ability to exercise jurisdictional and political control over that entity. And so location of the headquarters is one aspect, but legal ownership and control is another. Um, if you remove the legal and the financial ownership piece, you actually solve a lot of the issues, um, provided obviously the, the location piece is addressed as well. Um, but those three criteria are, uh, in my view, the most important ones. I mean, it probably won't be easy um, to really clearly define what Chinese uh, influence or Communist Party uh, influence is over those companies. Um, and so, you know, some people have um, raised concerns and, you know, the Yale University economist and former uh, Morgan Stanley Asia chair, Stephen Roach, um, called the House bill of TikTok, basically, it, he said it's sinophobic. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't agree with most things that Stephen Roach says, and his record of being wrong on most China-related questions speaks for itself. With that being said, um, I actually think it's um, I actually think the House bill is sinophile. Look, the first victim of the Chinese the Chinese Communist Party is a political party. It is not, you know, um, it is not the same thing as Chinese civilization and you know, the nation of China, although the CCP would like to conflate the two. Uh, being critical of the Chinese Communist Party is not the same thing as being critical of the Chinese people. In fact, the Chinese people are arguably have been the first victims of the brutality and the authoritarian practices of the Chinese Communist Party. The critique that most policymakers in the US have about China are really focused on the Chinese Communist Party, its political agenda, the fact that its brutality towards its own people, whether it's in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang, and the fact that it has an international agenda that is fundamentally at odds with the US. Um, ultimately, being critical of that agenda is not sinophobic. It's actually uh, the right thing to do from a human rights standpoint, both around the world, as well as uh, from a human rights standpoint for the Chinese people. So I don't think it's sinophobic at all. And, and probably just from rule of law and also, you know, what is the better way of doing business and fair competition and all these aspects. Um, and on that, um, you also have been behind the initiative to sort of stop uh, more U.S. investment from flowing to China. Uh, do you think that's possible? And can you just elaborate on sort of what you're hoping to accomplish um, with that. I, I think it's possible. I think you're seeing more and more companies and firms um, look at China as an, an, an uninvestable asset because, you know, on the one hand, uh, they're seeing increasing scrutiny uh, in Washington on uh, cross-border transactions between the U.S. and China as tensions are um, are rising. But on the other hand, they're also seeing the political environment and the business environment in China becoming a lot less friendly to foreign investment. And so it's no surprise that um, uh, new foreign investment into China 
this year has actually dropped to a three-year low. Um, obviously, economic growth is uh, facing significant headwinds, um, all of which is not being helped by the fact that the political climate in China is very, very hostile if you're a foreign company. If you're a foreign company, your employees could get criminalized uh, if they do basic due diligence, if, if they engage in basic due diligence practices um, that is considered completely normal and legal in most other countries, they could be treated as spies. So all of these types of new rules make it very hard to do business in China. And I have to ask, um, because, you know, right now, for example, uh, there's this new story that uh, a number of Chinese, C uh, sorry, American CEOs are currently in Beijing and will be meeting Xi Jinping uh, on Wednesday. Uh, clearly, there's still a lot of companies, American companies and CEOs who want to reassure uh, Beijing that their investment and commitment to China uh, continues. And how... How do you explain this phenomenon? Given just, you know, China is increasingly viewed as a, a risky market uh, to do business. Why do they continue to do that? Well, a lot of them have pre-existing, you know, there's a, an important distinction to be made between new investment and legacy and, you know, um, making investments to support legacy operations. Um, a lot of companies have a lot of legacy operations in the form of factories, in the form of CapEx and joint venture partnerships that are already there. And so in a world where a lot of companies are looking at de-risking and moving some of their operations to Vietnam and, um, and India, uh, they still have to continue maintaining a lot of their legacy operations in China. And I think a lot of the, the types of investments that you're seeing um, are actually being uh, deployed in China to do just that. So are you, in that vein, right, are you advocating for complete withdrawal from China or gradual, or is it more new investments not going to China? Uh, so um, I think it's not realistic to tell, uh, to ask our companies to um, move everything overnight, you know, because Ch the reality is China has a lot of infrastructure that's very sticky and very hard to replicate elsewhere in a short amount of time. But I am strongly in favor of repealing permanent normal trade relations and um, having a tariff regime with Chinese entities and the People's Republic of China uh, that creates a macroeconomic environment uh, that provides companies with a strong incentive to go about the business of reshoring their supply chains elsewhere outside of China quickly. We need them to do this fast. Um, Admiral John Aquilino said just a few weeks ago that China, by all conventional metrics, is on track to having and building the capabilities, that, uh, the military capabilities it needs in order to invade Taiwan by 2027. So we could be on the precipice of a major type of confrontation in the Asia Pacific that we shouldn't um, falsely signal to our companies that we're living in business as usual times. These are not uh, times where business should be conducted as usual, they need to reshore quickly if they want to be able to survive a potential geopolitical shock. Yeah, I, I think most companies have come to this realization now. It's no longer business as usual. Um, and in fact, because of the geopolitical uh, situation, it seems like the defense industry is doing uh, pretty well. And what we are seeing is that you know, Congressman Mike Gallagher, uh, who's been very effective and, and just visited Taiwan, is stepping down from the chairmanship of the House Select Committee on China um, and is resigning early from his congressional seat to join Palantir, where you're also a, a senior advisor. Um, can you share with us why is this hurry? Well, Mike's plans for what he decides to do after his tenure in the House are still only rumors and ultimately up for him and his family to decide.
Okay. Um, and do you think that the defense industry is benefiting from the current geopolitical tensions, not just Taiwan Strait, but, you know, Ukraine, Russia, and uh, the Middle East and, you know, elsewhere? Is this uh, is a good business right now? I mean, um, so I guess if your question is about Palantir, you know, actually most of the growth is coming from the private sector, Palantir's private business. Uh, Palantir is a company that does a lot of business in the public sector and the private sector. Mm -hmm. Its private sector business has grown incredibly rapidly. And so, um, and so, you know, that's where that's been a huge area of growth, uh, for Palantir specifically. Now, when it comes to legacy contractors, um, you know, there's no question that, um, look, if we need more planes, if we need more ships, you know, that's probably going to be good for legacy contractors. But I will say, if you look at the overall, you know, the overall amount of money that we spend in defense in the U.S., and then if you just look at outputs, you know, how many ships do we have? How many planes do we have? You know, how many missiles do we have compared to, you know, the amount of money that our four more, most political rivals abroad, like China, spend um, on defense and the capabilities they get for every dollar. They have a lot more ships. They have a lot more of almost everything. And so, you know, when you ask whether it's good for business, I think it's important to, to say that um, it's really, really that in a lot of ways, as a country, we have suffered enormously uh, from the atrophying of our defense industrial base. So I think it's really important that we think through how do we deploy capital in the defense ecosystem in a way that actually helps rejuvenate that industrial base so that we can actually get a lot more output for every dollar that is an input into a defense expenditure. I think that is really a, one of the central questions of our time. Yeah. And probably, uh, you know, with the new technologies, uh, AI and, you know, quantum computing, where a lot of it touches on, you know, sort of national competency kind of uh, technologies, um, you know, the U.S. certainly needs to think more about um, how to concentrate and align private expertise as well as uh, government priorities. Um you know, on that, what are the other key China related issues you're hoping to accomplish over the remainder of this term um, of Congress and even into the Trump administration, which may be a wild card? Well, I'm very, very supportive of uh, ultimately having a holistic recalibration of our tech trade agenda with China holistically. Um, I think we're way past due a holistic recalibration of our overall trade agenda with China. What Ultimately, should that look like when you say that? What should that look like? It does feel like our current government in the U.S. right now, it's pretty uh, spread out and not sure if there is a very uh, central centrally coordinated approach. That means um, that means being brutally honest about the fact that the Chinese are not our friends. They're decoupling from us. And when I say the Chinese, I mean the Chinese Communist Party are not our friends. They're decoupling from us incredibly quickly. They're uh, building out their military. And we need to be honest about the fact that on the software side, we need um, strong restrictions on Chinese software in the US uh, that can be imposed quickly. And on the hardware side, we need a tariff regime that creates a strong incentive to move our hardware supply chains outside of China to get those supply chains outside of the reach of China's jurisdictional and political control. We need to do that very, very quickly. And then on the capital flow side, we do need to have um, new restrictions on cross-border US-China capital flows. Um, we can't have you know, a situation where you still have an enormous uh, number of Chinese venture capital firms that are still investing in some of our most sensitive AI technologies in the US. That shouldn't be happening. Um, likewise, it doesn't make sense at this point to have American pension fund money and retirement accounts 
being deployed in the People's Republic of China, where private property is, you know, nothing but a vague illusion. So I think we really need to have a holistic recalibration of our entire trading relationship with China. And I think, you know, the easiest place to start are tariffs, software restrictions, and capital flow restrictions. Well, thank you. Uh, I think you have been uh, one of the people that uh, truly are pushing and thinking hard about how to address uh, China as a threat holistically, especially from the technology sector. And I'm glad that today you get to talk to our audience uh, in a more um in a, in a lengthier way, more than just, you know, a few sound bites. So thank you, Jacob, so much. And we'll be, uh, you know, paying attention to what's to come uh, in the legislative agenda. But thank you. It was great seeing you.